Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Josefina kept ringing the doorbell for several minutes, but in vain. At one point, she heard footsteps on the other side, but soon there was silence again. Lita, please open the door, it's me. Josefina called out in impatience. But no one was in a hurry to open the door. Come on, I know you are at home, so don't hide from me. I saw your car outside. Josefina said with irritation. But silence was still the answer. Then Josefina's imagination began to picture the horrible scenes of her best friend suffering in agony, and there was no one to help her. Lita, are you okay? Should I call an ambulance? I'll be right back. Just hang in there. Josefina took her phone out of her purse, and at that moment she heard some noise behind the door. A moment later, the door finally opened. Carmelita was standing on the threshold, in a short robe, barefoot, with loose hair, and looking at her friend in a confused and frightened way. Thank God you're alive. I had already imagined the worst things. Why did it take you so long to open the door? I didn't even know if you okay or not. Josefina complained, entering the apartment. I was so afraid that something bad had happened to you. She went on, taking off her jacket. I thought about your asthma attack back in high school, remember? I was so worried about you back then, I still tremble when I think about it. Do you remember how you started choking because of asthma at summer camp at the disco? The boy you were dancing with fainted from fright, and our camp counselor almost turned gray. You caused such chaos. I just imagined that you felt sick again, and my heart almost jumped out of my chest with fear. You know I'm really afraid of your asthma attacks. I thought, what if you forgot your asthma medicine in the car and you didn't have it when you needed it? I called you a hundred times today, and you still don't answer. Please don't scare me like that again. Why do you keep silent? Say something. At least tell me, how is your health? Josefina looked at her friend's face. She was unnaturally pale and seemed to be trembling. I'm all right. Lita mumbled faintly. All right? Seriously? I don't think so. You're as pale as chalk. What took you so long to open the door? Josefina asked, taking off her boots. I was asleep. Lita answered quietly. You live like a princess. It is lunchtime and you are still asleep. You must have stayed up late last night. Were you surfing dating websites again? Come on, tell me, did you meet anyone decent? Josefina asked her friend a lot of questions. Why are you here? Shouldn't you be at work? Carmelita asked, ignoring her questions. I decided to leave early today. I got everything done, and my boss let me go home. My Mateo left for a business trip the other day, this time to the north. So I was like, why should I spend Friday night alone? Why don't you and I have a spontaneous party, just like in the good old days? Remember? I brought two bottles of champagne and fresh strawberries, which cost a fortune, but no wonder, it's February. I wanted to surprise you because I know how much you like strawberries. I thought you'd be happy. We'll chat, gossip, and laugh over a glass of champagne, as usual. Josefina said as she handed Carmelita a heavy bag full of groceries. You know I don't like surprises. Lita answered, trying not to look Josefina in the eye. She was nervous. Come on, everyone loves nice surprises, both adults and children. If someone prepared a nice surprise for me, I would be overjoyed. Why are you acting like you're not yourself? You're silent, like a fish. Aren't you happy to see me? Perhaps I came here in vain. Darling, what is going on? What happened? Josefina was confused. Carmelita shifted from foot to foot in the corridor. After a short silence, she looked at her friend, and that guilty look made Josefina's heart ache with a bad feeling. What on earth is going on? She cried out. Why are you staring at me like a dog who did something wrong looking at its master? What happened to you? Did someone die or something? Why are you looking like dead? Can I come in anyway, or are you going to kick me out? 
And at that moment, Josefina saw the familiar brown leather boots in the hallway, and she recognized them at once. They belonged to her husband, Mateo. There could be no mistake. She had helped him pick them out a couple of weeks ago at the shoe store. Why Mateo's shoes are here? Josefina wondered. Then she looked up at the coat rack. There was his beige coat. Why hadn't she noticed it immediately? And by the mirror, on the dressing table, were his suede gloves. Josefina's thoughts were confused. Boots, coat, gloves. She could not put the puzzle together into a whole picture. I don't understand it. Is Mateo here? Josefina asked in a muffled voice, refusing to believe what was happening. Carmelita nodded, faintly, instead of answering. Where is he? I want to see him. Look, maybe you shouldn't. Lita answered confusedly, blocking the way. But Josefina easily pushed her friend's skinny body aside and went into the apartment. First, she checked the kitchen. It was empty. There were only two empty glasses on the table, a plate of snacks, and a half-full bottle of expensive French brandy hinting at the recent romantic dinner. Josefina walked to the bedroom door, froze for a moment, and then pushed on the handle. The door opened, and she saw her husband, Mateo, on her friend's bed. Look, Josie, it's not what you think. I can explain. He began to talk confusedly. So that's what your business trip is all about. His wife interrupted him. She was boiling inside. You've got it all wrong. Mateo tried to justify himself, pulling on his pants in a hurry. Yes, I thought you were making love, but in fact, you were discussing the budget of the company for the next year in her bed, right? Josefina said sarcastically. She turned around and saw Carmelita red as a boiled lobster, biting her lower lip nervously. Josefina knew her friend's habit. She always did this when she was nervous. Aren't you ashamed? Josefina asked, glaring at her. I am sorry. I know it is my fault, but I didn't mean to hurt you, really. She said, stammering a little. So how long have you been seeing each other behind my back? Josefina asked. Well, it's not really important. Even if it happened only once, it's enough. But still, how long has it been going on? Six months. Carmelita answered quietly. Josefina covered her face with her hands and wanted to disappear at that moment, to fade away like a mist. I'm sorry, Josie. I'm so sorry I hurt you. I'm an idiot, a stupid jerk. Well, hit me if you want to, curse me. It started so spontaneously, so ridiculous. Mateo tried to explain as he put on his t-shirt. I didn't expect it myself. Lita asked me to bring her medicine, and I arrived. She was lying on the bed, so vulnerable, so fragile, and somehow everything happened by itself, and it went like an avalanche. These pathetic excuses made Josefina feel even worse. It would be better if he were silent now. Every word he said was like a stabbing. A lump rose up in her throat and tears poured down her cheeks. What a disgusting scene, just like in some vulgar joke or cheap novels. Josefina sobbed. I thought that you and I had a good family, Mateo. That you and I loved and trusted each other, that we appreciated everything we had. I mean, we had far-reaching plans, we dreamed of having children, and we even went to the doctor last week. I was sure we were a real family. And it all turned out to be nothing, just a lie. You were cheating on me and slept with my friend. With my best friend, the one I considered my sister. It's just a peak of cynicism. I can only imagine how you laughed at me here. No, you are wrong, Josie. Please, forgive me. Carmelita said. I don't know how this happened either. I'm so sorry. You are like a sister to me. Our friendship is the most precious thing in the world. Don't touch me with your dirty hands, you traitor. Josefina shouted, pulling away from Carmelita's embrace. Please, everyone, let's calm down. Let's sit down and talk. Mateo suggested. I have nothing to say to both of you. Josefina answered sharply. It was really difficult for Josefina to control herself and not attack them with her fists. She was confused and devastated. These two were the dearest people for her, and she certainly didn't expect such betrayal from them. 
from her husband, the man with whom she shared everything, and from her best friend, whom she had known since childhood, with whom she had shared her deepest secrets, joys, and sorrows for a long time. She was ready to die for them without hesitation. How could they lie so brazenly, looking her in the eye all this time? How could she have been so wrong about them? It was a spit in the soul. They trampled and destroyed everything she cherished. Her wounded ego demanded revenge. Josefina desperately wanted to tell these traitors everything she thought of them, to have a real drama with breaking dishes, slaps, and hysterics. But she knew that right now she needed to keep her pride. How could this happen? When did Mateo's love go away? And how can she live after that? How can she accept the fact that the closest and dearest person had betrayed her trust? Her heart ached. Their relationship had such a wonderful start, and after they had met, he had become an integral part of her life. It seemed like it was yesterday. The first time Mateo saw her was at the ice rink. It was a beautiful winter day. Snowflakes were falling quietly in the light of the street lamps, some romantic melody was coming from the loudspeakers, and Mateo was ice skating with his seven-year-old twin nephews and was looking at the green-eyed girl with long brown curls under her funny red hat. Josefina noticed the stare of the young man, he was her type, but the curious stranger was there with two children, and the girl logically assumed that he was their father, and, therefore, a family man. Married men with or without children were an unbreakable taboo for 22-year-old Josefina, who ignored the ardent glances of the young man. At one point, Mateo was so focused on her that he didn't notice a teenager approaching him at full speed, they collided and Mateo fell on the ice. He was hurt, but he moaned not from pain, but from despair because his green-eyed beauty in a red hat had disappeared somewhere without a trace. In frustration, Mateo picked up his nephews from the ice rink and headed home. On the way, they also needed to stop at the grocery store. There, Mateo loaded up the cart with the groceries and also took lots of sweets and chocolate bars for the children. He was about to go to the checkout when he suddenly remembered that he was out of coffee. Mateo went to the stand, took a pack of coffee, and when he turned to put it in the cart, he found that the cart had disappeared. At first, he thought it was his troublemaking nephews playing a prank, but the kids assured him they didn't do anything at all. Mateo started to look for the stolen cart full of groceries. He went through the whole supermarket three times, but he still couldn't find the cart. Losing hope, he walked up to the security guard and explained that someone had taken his cart with all its contents. The guard was sympathetic to the customer's problem and tried to find it as well, but unfortunately, he was unsuccessful. Alas, there is nothing more I can do, the security guard said. Maybe one of the employees thought that someone just left the cart in the middle of the store because they changed their mind about buying anything it happens sometimes. Get a new one and load up the groceries. There was no choice if Mateo had to walk around the huge store again, loading the necessary goods into the shopping cart. What a terrible day, I missed the girl from the ice rink and the grocery cart, too. Good thing my nephews were around, and I always keep my wallet with me. Mateo sighed as he began to put everything he needed into the cart again. This time he did not let go of the cart, and when he approached the cash register, he saw his loss. His lost cart was standing right in front of him, safe and sound. Mateo looked up to see the rascal who needed someone else's groceries and gasped. There she was, the green-eyed stranger from the rink. His anger immediately evaporated and was replaced by joy, because this time Mateo had the perfect excuse to start a dialogue. As it turned out, Josefina had taken someone else's cart by mistake, and a minute later they were both laughing at this silly misunderstanding. I don't even know what I'm going to do with a double set of groceries. Mateo joked. Don't worry, uncle, we'll help you, at least with chocolates. The nephew said. Josefina immediately understood that they were not Mateo's children, and for some reason, she felt great joy in her heart. Together with Mateo and his brisk nephews, they easily found her cart, standing lonely in the corner. Afterward, they went back to the cash register. Their Mateo, like a gentleman, gallantly let the girl go first. When it was time to pay for her purchases, Josefina suddenly turned red and, looking at the cashier in confusion, said, 
Excuse me, please, I just noticed that I forgot my wallet or lost it at the ice rink. Seriously? Now I have to do a cancellation for every item. The irritated cashier muttered angrily. There are already a lot of people in line, and due to klutzes like you, it will be even more people. I have to do extra work because of you. Stop grumbling, I'll pay for it, Mateo said suddenly. No, that's okay, you don't have to do it. The girl protested. We don't even know each other, you don't know me at all, and... It's okay. Mateo assured her, handing the cashier banknote. At this moment he felt like a brave knight on a white horse, who saved a beautiful lady at a tragic moment. The cashier eagerly accepted the money, pleased that she didn't have to do extra work. Then she checked all Mateo's purchases, and in a minute the friendly company was on their way to the exit. I am very embarrassed, you have helped me so much, even though we are strangers. Your gesture is very noble, thank you very much, Josefina repeated over and over again. But I feel so uncomfortable, I have to give you your money back. Would it be convenient for you to come to my place now? I live nearby. I'd pay you back right away. I'm afraid I can't, I have to be home in ten minutes, the little ones have class soon. Mateo said, nodding at his nephews. That's a pity. Josefina said. But what should we do then? Well, you could give me your phone number and I will call you in a week and we can make an appointment. The quick-witted Mateo suggested. Perfect. She smiled and dictated her number. Mateo couldn't believe his luck. An hour ago, he thought he'd lost the green-eyed beauty forever and now he knows her name and, moreover, has her phone number. However, Mateo's euphoria lasted exactly until he tried to call Josefina. Several times he dialed the cherished digits, but the monotonous voice repeated that the dialed number did not exist. Mateo could not understand what it was, had she tricked him? But such a decent-looking girl didn't look like a liar. During the next week, Mateo was gloomier than a thundercloud, and on Saturday his nephews persuaded him to go to the ice rink again. And there. Mateo. A pleasant woman's voice called out to him. He turned around and saw Josefina rushing towards him on skates. I'm glad I met you here. Where on earth have you been? I've been waiting for your call all week. She complained. I've been trying to call you, Mateo answered with a bitter chuckle. Except that the number doesn't exist. What do you mean it doesn't exist? It is impossible. Josefina frowned. Can you show me the number you called? It turned out that Mateo entered one of the numbers wrong. That's how their romance began, and a year later they had a big wedding. And now, five years later, she catches him in bed with her best friend. Let's go into the kitchen and discuss it over a cup of coffee. Carmelita said. Are you kidding? Josefina was indignant. I will never sit at the same table with you. You are like a viper who invaded my marriage and ruined it. If things had been good in your marriage, this would never have happened, Josie, Carmelita remarked. You don't know anything about our marriage. Josefina said, raising her voice. You don't know what a family is. You fly around like a butterfly from one bed to another, from one man to another. You talk as if I were the only one to blame. Carmelita said, with an offended look on her face. No, you're not the only one. I'm just as much to blame for that. I am guilty of being nice to both of you. I thought you were the dearest people to me, and I loved and trusted both of you unconditionally. Josefina's voice trembled. She tried to pull herself together, but it was impossible. Please, calm down. Her husband asked her. You shouldn't be so nervous. Don't tell me what to do. She shouted. I have had enough. I don't want to stay here any longer. I'm leaving. Josefina headed towards the exit, but Mateo immediately rushed after her. Please wait. Let's leave together. She means nothing to me. The husband spoke confusedly. Means nothing? Carmelita's indignant voice was heard. That's not what you told me last night. Shut up. Mateo shouted at her. Don't you dare tell me to shut up. 
Let me remind you that you are not at home. You are in my apartment. Lita shouted back at him. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot you're on a business trip. You bitch. Mateo shouted. Traitor. Carmelita answered him. Go to hell, both of you. Josefina said and left the apartment. She decided not to wait for the elevator and ran down the stairs. Josefina got out of the building and walked briskly toward the driveway. Her greatest fear at this moment was that Mateo might try to catch up with her. An unbearable pain tormented her soul. Are they really in love and this is the end? Josefina pondered, wiping away the tears. She refused to believe what was happening. How could her Mateo give in to temptation? How could he offend her so much? Everything shrank inside her when she thought about the fact that she had been tricked for six months. Josefina felt very bad. Why on earth did I decide to go to Lita's today? She thought to herself. If I had just stayed at work, none of this would have happened. Isn't it better to live in peace and know nothing and happily exist in blind ignorance? It is not for nothing that wise people say, the less you know, the better you sleep. As she approached the road, she wanted to catch a cab. Josefina. Suddenly Mateo's voice was heard somewhere in the distance. She turned around and saw her unfaithful husband hurrying toward her on the icy sidewalk. Wait, please, let's talk. He shouted. When he was only 50 meters away from his wife, a taxi cab pulled up near Josefina. What address do you need to go to? The gray-haired driver asked. Josefina opened the door quickly and jumping into the cab, commanded, Just drive forward. The cab driver hit the gas and the car started. Mateo looked sadly after the car as it drove away. It was warm and comfortable inside, but Josefina trembled. She experienced this before. It was a reaction to stress. She knew she needed to calm down to warm up. Her phone vibrated and she glanced at the screen. Mateo was calling. Josefina dropped the call and switched the phone to silent mode. At that moment, a romantic rock ballad was playing on the radio, a song she and Mateo had chosen for their wedding dance. The girl could not stand the rush of emotion and burst into tears. Why are you crying? The elderly cab driver asked. Personal matters. Josefina answered. Why don't you tell me about your problems? Maybe it will help you feel better. You know, I'm a very good listener. I promise not to interrupt. Should I tell you? But we don't know each other. Josefina answered. Sometimes it is easier to say something to a stranger than to someone close to you. The driver smiled. You know, sometimes it seems to us that there's no way out, that we're at a dead end. But that's not really the case. It's just that in stressful situations, people are unable to notice some important things, and sometimes it's easier to see the full picture from the outside. Well, then maybe you can explain to me why men cheat. Why are they like animals unable to resist temptation? I feel so crappy right now. My husband and I lived together for five years. At first, we dated, then we realized that we wanted to be together forever. We started planning a life together and saving up money for a wedding. Like any girl, since childhood, I dreamed of a beautiful white dress so that all my friends envied me. I dreamed of the restaurant, the memorable photos, many guests who would shout hurrah, and the bouquet I would throw into the crowd of well-dressed girls. I wanted to remember my wedding for the rest of my life as the most amazing event ever. I truly believed that marriage should only happen once in a lifetime, one wedding, one man, and one life. It probably sounds naive, not modern, but that's how I was raised. My beloved husband's name is Matteo. He is a very talented engineer who graduated with honors from university and got a prestigious job and a good position. His job requires frequent business trips. Frankly, I did not like it when he left. Since childhood, I hate separation. My father was a geologist and sometimes he was away from home for months. I remember how my mother and I used to wait for him, looking out of the window for hours, and I felt so sad. I still remember that feeling. 
but still, I tolerated Mateo's business trips, I understood that his career and, consequently, the financial well-being of our family depended on his frequent business trips. Do you have children together? The cab driver asked. No. We'd been dreaming about having a baby for a long time, but I couldn't get pregnant. Recently we had an appointment with the doctor, we had an examination, an ultrasound, and a bunch of tests, but it doesn't matter anymore. There will be no baby, at least not with him. But he and my friend Carmelita might have a baby. I caught them today in her apartment, I thought my husband was away for a business trip, but he was in her bed. Funny, isn't it? I think the situation is really sad. The cab driver answered with a worried look. Yes, you are right. One of my colleagues thinks that all men are jerks, that they are polygamous by nature, and women should not expect a swan's fidelity from their partners. Numerous times I argued with her, standing up for men, because I strongly believe that every man is able to control his instincts, including my Mateo. Why cheat if things are good between you? That's what I thought. I have never cheated on my husband, I just didn't need it, although I had the opportunity, my colleague, Rena, had been courting me at work for a long time, and you know, he is a very interesting man. A handsome man with dark hair and oriental features can easily make any woman's head spin, and he knows a lot about wooing and compliments, it's not so easy to resist. However, I always remained an unassailable fortress for him, and not because I didn't want to or because I was so high moral, but because I loved my husband and believed that he loved me too. And if so, then there is no need for an affair. But it turns out that I was wrong, and now I don't know how to go on, it's like the ground is gone from under my feet, there is total darkness in my soul, and I want to howl in pain, like a dog that is lost. And I also have a terrible feeling of self-pity, and it is very humiliating and unpleasant to realize it. But the fact is, I was deceived and now I'm unhappy. I'm sorry, I must have bored you with my story, but you know, you were right. I told you everything, I poured my heart out, and now I really feel a little better. You don't have to apologize, I understand you very well. The man smiled affectionately. Better than you can imagine. Do you understand? Josefina asked him again. Were you cheated on too? Alas, you are not alone in your misfortune. Your humble servant has not escaped this fate either. The man replied. And what did you do? Josefina asked, intrigued. I have forgiven her. The stranger calmly answered. Forgiven? But how? You just turned a blind eye and went on living as if nothing had happened? Just like that. The cab driver nodded. No, I definitely can't do that. Josefina shook her head. I don't think cheating can be justified. If someone has cheated, it means they don't love anymore. That's all. Those who cheated once will cheat twice, some wise man said, and I completely agree with him. I'm sure the cheater won't stop there, and everything will happen again after a while. And I don't want any lies in my relationship. I think that spouses should trust each other, and I can't trust Mateo anymore, and I don't want to live on a powder keg, waiting for him to cheat again. It's like an alcoholic after rehab, they can lose control at any moment. I don't want to suffer with suspicions, and then drown in the ocean of his adultery. I'm filing for divorce tomorrow. You know, the first minutes when I found out my wife was not faithful to me, I had a feeling that the whole world collapsed. The elderly cab driver confessed. My wife and I were 30 years old at the time, and everything seemed fine. We just bought an apartment, and we were raising a five-year-old daughter, but overnight, life went down the drain when my wife, Nellie, fell in love with another man, a German. How did you find out about it? Josefina asked. At first, I noticed some changes in her behavior, and soon she confessed it to me. Nellie was working for an international company at the time, and this foreigner named Otto often came for long business trips and worked together with her in the office. That's how they got to know each other and became close. That must have been very painful for you. That's right, I was shocked when I found out. 
So, just like you, at first, I wanted to end our relationship, but in a situation like this, it is important to stop and think about what happens next. I simply imagined my future life in two vectors, with her and without her. I realized that without Nelly everything would be meaningless, and then I decided that no matter what, I would try to save our family. I wanted my wife to come back to me, to love only me, as it was before. I had to win her back so that the three of us could live in our own little world and be inseparable again. My mind kept telling me, go away, leave her, forget her, but I listened to my heart and it told me to try to understand my wife. Understand your wife? Is that possible in this situation? Josefina wondered. It is possible. If that is what you really want. The driver answered. I realize that she is in love and sees everything through the prism of her new feelings. She idealizes this Otto. She sees him as the hero of a novel, but in reality, he may not be as good as she thinks. What can I say? I understood that German man. Damn it. The German? Your rival? Josefina was astonished. Of course. Because it's impossible not to fall in love with a woman like my Nelly. The cab driver assured her. And what happened next? And then Otto's business trip ended, and he went back to Bavaria. I hoped that would be the end of it, but it wasn't. Otto kept writing her letters and calling her, and I could see that my wife missed him, and it was unbearable. While this whole situation was going on, it was difficult for both of us. We talked a lot, discussed, and pondered what was wrong with our marriage, and why it had happened to us. I was filled with horror imagining my Nelly leaving for Germany and taking our daughter with her. I can only imagine what you were feeling. How long did it last? Josefina asked. It was almost a year before my spouse came to her senses and cooled down a bit from this crazy love. The cab driver replied. I guess she finally realized how pragmatic Otto was. Maybe he wasn't a bad person, I don't know. But still, our mentality is very different from the German's mentality. I guess Nelly realized that, too. And she finally realized how much I loved her and how patiently I waited for her return without reproaches or complaints. We finally had a crucial conversation. My wife was crying, begging me to forgive her for all the pain she had caused me. Honestly, even I wiped away my tears. She asked, will I ever be able to forgive her? I sincerely replied that yes, because I had made up my mind a long time ago. You may think that I am a wuss. No, I can assure you, I don't think so. Even if you think so, it's okay, I'm not offended. But I'll tell you one thing, I was very happy during all those years until my wife died two years ago of cancer. I'm so sorry. Josefina said quietly, You must be very lonely without her. After all, you've lived together all your life. I am not lonely at all. Nelly and I have three beautiful grandchildren. I shudder to think that all this might not have happened if I had let my pride get in the way. So before you let yourself panic and make decisions based on emotion, ask yourself the question, what happens then? And then decide if you're ready to break up or can forgive him and save the relationship. But keep in mind that forgiveness must be sincere and real, otherwise, jealousy and mistrust will follow you like a shadow, and in the end, it will ruin everything. In fact, it is not easy to leave the person with whom you are connected by so many memories. It's important to understand that the rest of your life depends on this decision, and you are the only one responsible for it. It is very difficult, but it is impossible to move on without it. So, you never once regretted forgiving your wife? Josefina asked. Honestly, I swear I never regretted it. The driver assured her. But how is it possible to forget something like that? Honestly, I can't believe you never thought about it. It took a while, but over time I was able to push the memory of the betrayal to a far corner of my soul. The elderly man confessed. And all those memories stopped bothering me. You just have to be patient. You probably know that the human soul develops and strengthens in trials and tribulations, so we can say that the test of adultery is one of the reasons for self-respect. I made my choice and lived a happy 40 years with a woman I truly loved. 
Anything my wife had with that German guy doesn't really matter, believe me. Why doesn't matter? Josefina wondered. Mateo betrayed me, but I loved him so much. Why do you speak of love in the past tense? Where did your love go? One false step and that was it. Is it over? If you loved so much, how could you fall out of love so quickly? Is one action capable of killing love? In that case, you should ask yourself, did you ever love him? Of course, I loved him until he ruined everything. And now I'm sorry I met him. It's much better to be alone, it's safer. Maybe you are right, but it's not easy being alone because you need two people to be happy. The cab driver answered. And if there are two people, the third is sure to slip into your relationship. The girl exclaimed angrily. And this happens for centuries. Meanwhile, the car pulled up in front of Josefina's building. The cab driver stopped at the entrance and the passenger paid and thanked him for the ride and the heartwarming conversation. Believe me, all bad things will disappear and only good things will remain. However, it is up to you to decide. The gray-haired driver told her goodbye. Josefina entered the apartment where everything reminded her of their recent simple and quiet happiness. Their portrait together on the wall, the photo from their wedding trip, the table lamp in the shape of two hearts that Mateo had given her for Valentine's Day. Thoughts buzzed in the unhappy wife's head like a swarm of bees, stinging with painful memories of former happiness. How happy, how good she had lived all these years when Mateo was by her side when in the evenings they settled on the couch, covered with a warm blanket, and watched some soap operas hugging each other tightly. He always insisted on detectives, and she wanted some melodrama, they could argue, but invariably they found a compromise. It seemed to her that they were made for each other. Josefina knew that she was not mistaken. They were really happy, both of them, and she thought that this idol would last forever. Mateo had always been attentive to her, always caring and gentle, but could she ever think of cheating? And now the sharp pain of knowing that they would never sit under the same blanket again, cuddled up together like two frozen sparrows, it tortured her soul. No more ice skating together, no more plans for the future. Josefina glanced at her phone. There were 20 missed calls from Mateo and three messages. Let's meet at home and talk about everything calmly. I'm on my way. He texted in the last message. Josefina realized that she didn't want to see him. She just didn't have the strength to sort things out, to listen to the pathetic excuses, and she definitely didn't want to heal about any details of his adultery. She wanted only one thing, to run away somewhere where no one would find her. But where to? The decision came spontaneously. Josefina dialed Rena's number. If it was about the report, you don't need to remind me. It is already on your desk. A pleasant male voice answered. No, it is not about that. Josefina said. Oh, really? Then why are you calling me? I am intrigued. Rena was surprised. I wanted to ask you if you are busy today. Maybe we could go out together? I can't believe my ears. Someone please pinch me. Rena exclaimed. Did something happen to you? No. Josefina lied. I just want to have a drink and relax. Well, then you dialed the right number. Rena answered. I'm in a bar on the seafront. Do you know where it is? Yes, it's not far from my place. I will be there soon. I am waiting, Rena answered. Twenty minutes later, Josefina entered the building. The bar was half empty. It was cool, half dark, smelled of tobacco and strong perfume. The lights were muted, and the music was pleasant. Contrary to expectations, Josefina liked it. She saw Rena immediately. He was alone at the bar, with a glass in his hand. Hello, Josefina said, making herself comfortable on a chair next to him. The irises of Rena's eyes were illuminated by the amber color of the cognac, which he was slowly savoring. Will you have a drink with me? He asked with a smile. Yes, I think so. Josefina answered. They chatted casually while sipping cognac. Rena didn't ask Josefina anything, and she was grateful for that. 
the last thing she wanted to discuss with him was the twists and turns of her family life. They sat very close, and she felt his hot breath on her skin. It excited her pleasantly. He was so close, so sexy, and so seductive, he was flirting with her, and she wanted to respond in kind, she had already forgotten what flirting meant. When a slow melody began to play, Rena asked Josefina to dance, they murmured something and laughed. The alcohol was flowing through their bodies in pleasant warmth. They both felt relaxed and happy. Rena embraced Josefina frankly, she felt his hot hands through her dress, and the smell of his cologne and alcohol made her dizzy. At one point, they reached out to each other and passionately kissed each other. At that moment, Josefina knew exactly where it was going. She could have stopped, but no. I will repay Mateo with the same coin, she thought vindicatively. Josefina simply relaxed and went with the flow of circumstances. She was careless and reckless, turned off all thoughts, and just enjoyed the moment. She didn't want to think about anything. Around midnight, the couple left the bar, taking with them a started bottle of cognac. They drank it all the way to the hotel and kissed each other like teenagers who'd escaped from school on prom night. And as soon as they entered the hotel room, Josefina and Rena fused together in a passion, and then they fell asleep in each other's arms, tired. She woke with the dawn, and at first she could not understand where she was at the ceiling, the unfamiliar wallpaper, the strange curtains. Her head was pounding, and she was thirsty. The woman hardly got up and looked at the naked Rena sleeping next to her. My God, what have I done, she thought in horror. Her heart was aching. It was the first time she had been in this situation, and she had no idea how to behave. Should she pretend it hadn't happened? Should she kiss Renal on the cheek and say goodbye? Or should she discuss what had happened and apologize to him? Josefina was extremely uncomfortable. She reached for the phone, which was on the bedside table, and found ten missed calls from her husband. I'm no better than him, Josefina thought bitterly. And in that moment, she felt disgusted with herself. As she felt her head throbbing with pain, she decided to get out of bed carefully, afraid to make any unnecessary movements so as not to wake the sleeping Renaud. She cautiously got out of bed and began to look around, trying to find her clothes, which were scattered all over the room. Josefina decided that the best thing to do was to sneak out quietly, but her plan failed, and suddenly she heard Renaud's sleepy voice. Are you awake, beautiful? He asked with a smile. Josefina flinched and saw him yawn widely and look at her with his searing almond-shaped eyes. Yes, I'm awake. Josefina answered nervously and turned her eyes away from her colleague, literally burning with embarrassment so as not to meet his gaze. What are you looking for? Rena asked her. My clothes. She answered quietly. Are you leaving already? So early? I have to go. Josefina answered, confused. She was ashamed that she had wanted to sneak away like a thief. But it's Saturday. Renau reminded her. I expected us to have breakfast together. I hate eating alone. I can't. I have to go. I'm going to be late. Josefina spoke confusedly. At this moment, she felt like a fool. Come on, relax. Rena smiled. Everything is all right. Well, what happened is what happened. We're not kids. We had too much to drink and we slept together. So what are we supposed to do? Avoid each other. It's stupid, don't you think? I can see that you're worried, but you shouldn't. Your husband won't find out, at least not from me. I don't know what happened between you and him. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. But believe me, I know how to keep my mouth shut. Let's act like civilized, modern people. Okay. Josefina nodded, calming down a little. But I don't know if I can. You will succeed. Renau winked at her. He understood Josefina, and that made things a little easier. Well, their attitude toward life, toward love, was very different. It was probably not the first time Renaud woke up in a hotel after a one-night stand. He seemed to be as relaxed and comfortable as a fish in water, which was not the case with Josefina. She didn't know yet how she would go to work on Monday and pretend that nothing had happened between them. 
After breakfast with Rana, they said their goodbyes, and Josefina went home. As she walked up the stairs to her floor, she thought about her upcoming meeting with Mateo. What if she followed the cab driver's example and forgave him? She thought, forget everything like a bad dream. He did a terrible thing. She made a mistake, too. Josefina imagined a scale. On one side, she lived without him and suffered, tormented by memories and reflections of how things might have been, and perhaps to the end of her life, she blamed herself for not forgiving and not giving her husband a second chance. On the other side of the scale is the opposite situation. She pulls herself together and gets through it all, just as the cab driver and his unfaithful spouse once did, and soon all this horror is forgotten. When Josefina put the key in the front door of her apartment, she had already made up her mind. A worried Mateo met her in the hallway. Their dialogue was brief but informative. I didn't realize what I was doing. I'm so sorry I hurt you. If I could turn back time, I would never do that. I beg you to forgive me. Give me one last chance and you won't regret it. I'll forgive you if you finally decide who you want. Josefina said, I don't want to stay in a love triangle. I have made up my mind. You are the dearest person in the world. You are the only one I love. Mateo assured his wife. For the next week, Josefina had no reason to be jealous. Everything was fine, and they became close again and lived like a normal happy couple. A month later, Josefina suddenly felt sick, with sudden dizziness and a tight feeling in her lower abdomen, going to the gynecologist, she was sure she was just hypothermic. You're pregnant. The doctor shocked her. Her joy at this unexpected news was immediately replaced with concern. Josefina could not say for sure who the father was. She decided to hide the fact that she was pregnant from Mateo for a while, though it was not easy because she had terrible morning sickness. She had to think about how to behave and what to do next. Her head was spinning. She had no idea what to do next, how to keep everything a secret from her husband, but what if it wasn't his baby? Then Mateo would have to raise and support Renat's child. Wouldn't that be dishonest? Wouldn't it be better to confess to Mateo the accidental adultery? Josefina thought. But what was the point of revealing this shameful fact if she was pregnant by her spouse? And if it was Rana's child, should she tell him? Josefina almost lost her mind with all these thoughts. She finally decided to go to the clinic to see if it was possible to have a DNA test during the pregnancy. That would clear things up. But the doctor explained to her that such a test was possible, but that there was some risk of termination of the pregnancy. Josefina could not risk the life of the unborn baby and gave up the idea. That night they had dinner with Mateo, and he was telling her something, but she wasn't listening because she was lost in her own thoughts. What is the matter with you? Mateo said, taking his wife's hand in his palm. What? Josefina said as if she had just come up out of the water. I mean, you haven't been yourself lately. Are you feeling all right? He asked. Yes, I'm fine. Josefina nodded. I see that you don't feel well in the morning. Mateo said. I don't want to hope in vain, but you know, I think you are pregnant. I know we have been dreaming about it for a long time and I would hate to be wrong. But I have the feeling that this time it works out. Josefina, you may think I'm an idiot, but I've got a pregnancy test. With these words, Mateo handed his wife the package from the pharmacy. Josefina felt trapped in a corner. Mateo, you're not wrong. I am pregnant. She confessed. I knew it, I knew it. Mateo exclaimed joyfully. His eyes shone with joy. He took Josefina in his arms and swung her around. How long have you known this? Why didn't you tell me right away? He wondered. Were you afraid you were mistaken? Yes, I was. Josefina nodded. She just didn't have the courage to confess to her husband at that moment. Oh my goodness, I am so happy. I am in heaven. Mateo exclaimed. I can't wait to tell everyone that we are going to have a baby. I want to shout about it so everyone can hear. Please, let's not be in a hurry. Josefina asked him. I'm still in the early term. Okay. 
Mateo agreed with her. But we have to think of a name for the baby. If it is a boy, we will name him Pedro, after the first Spanish astronaut Pedro Duque, or Diego, like the Mexican actor Diego Benetta. And if it's a girl, Martina, after my grandmother. Do you like it? I like it. Josefina agreed. She felt awful at this moment. Mateo was obsessed with his upcoming fatherhood. From that moment on, he was constantly talking about his future heir, making plans about what school he would send the child to and what clubs he would enroll him in. He dreamed about how he would walk with the stroller in the park and go to the slide in winter. He picked out on the internet a stroller and even a suitable sled and skateboard. And it took a lot of effort to talk her husband into postponing the purchase. And, on the other hand, she could not stop him from renovating the room, which she had decided to use as a nursery. Mateo enthusiastically painted the walls and glued the wallpaper himself. Now when he returned from work, the first thing he did was to rush to Josefina's belly, stroke it, kiss it, and talk for hours to the unborn baby. In the evenings he read books to the baby, he bought dozens of children's books. And one day Mateo brought a CD and handed it to his wife. What is it? Josefina wondered. It's a collection of classical music. I read the other day that it's good for babies in utero to listen to classical music. Doctors believe that it has a positive effect on the intellectual and emotional development of the fetus. Mateo surrounded his wife with love and attention, taking care of all the housework, cleaning, ironing, and laundry. He also made sure she ate well and stocked the refrigerator with food, making sure Josefina's diet was nutritious and multivariate. You have to eat well. He would say, There are lots of fruits and vegetables. They are rich in vitamins and fiber. Mateo insisted on going with his wife to the first ultrasound and listened with fascination to the baby's heartbeat. Tears came to his eyes at that heartwarming moment. How can I tell him that maybe it's not his baby? Josefina pondered with confused feelings. She knew that Mateo would be a great father, but she could not be completely happy, her conscience constantly gnawing at her. Josefina saw her husband rejoicing, waiting, dreaming of a future baby, and she felt bitter. More than anything, she wanted the baby to be from her husband, but she was not sure of that. She realized that the longer she waited, the worse the situation became. One day Mateo came home with a big box. Josefina opened it and saw a shiny bicycle. I was passing by the store, saw this beauty in the window, and I just couldn't resist. He confessed. I also ordered two matching t-shirts for me and our baby. I know you're going to scold me, but I thought it would be really cool. And Josefina realized that the difficult conversation couldn't be delayed any longer. Mateo, we need to talk. She said quietly, Please cancel your order. You may not need it. Why not? He was surprised. Is there something wrong with our baby? I am not sure it is your baby. At this moment, Josefina felt like an executioner. What do you mean? I don't understand. What do you mean not mine? Who's then? Mateo said in confusion. Rena, a colleague from work. Josefina said frankly. I don't understand. What does Rena have to do with it? I slept with him the night I caught you with Lita. It was stupid, but I was completely broken and didn't know what I was doing. Mateo looked at his wife with puzzled eyes. I can't believe it. How could you? the same way you could. The only difference is that it lasted six months for you and it only happened once with me. But that's different. Mateo exclaimed. It's one thing to sleep with someone and another thing to have a baby with some strange man. Just so you know, I use protection. Do you realize what you've done? How could you be so irresponsible? Josefina felt a lump in her throat. You're the one who pushed me to do this. She shouted, I just wanted to get revenge on you. Now you've been in my shoes. Don't blame it on me. Mateo got even angrier. You made me feel like a pathetic jerk, and you made me beg for forgiveness on my knees while you acted like a total slut. Don't you dare insult me. Josefina said, 
At that moment, she felt a sharp pain in her lower abdomen. Call an ambulance immediately, she said to Mateo. The doctors took Josefina to the hospital, where she was diagnosed with increased uterine tone and with a risk of miscarriage. And she had to stay at the hospital for a while. Josefina spent a month and a half in the hospital. During that time, Mateo never visited her. He didn't even text or call her. Josefina didn't call him either. Why bother? She would be bombarded with reproaches, attacks, and accusations, the last thing she needed in her condition. One day while Josefina was reading a book, there was a knock on the door of her hospital room. She looked up from her book and saw Lita in front of her. May I come in? She asked timidly. No, Josefina answered flatly. But Carmelita crossed the threshold anyway. I brought you some apples, red and sour, as you like. She said, holding out the bag. That is very kind of you, thank you, but I don't want anything from you. Josefina answered. Listen, stop being offended. Let's forget this unpleasant incident forever. Lita suggested. You talk about it as if it were no big deal. Josefina raised her eyebrows in surprise. But you have forgiven Mateo. Lita said. Why are you still so mad at me? I wonder why women always blame the mistresses for the affair and not their husbands. I think it's very stupid. That's like accusing vodka of being drunk by a drunkard. Do you think it's not your fault at all? I didn't say that. That's partly my fault, too. Lita nodded. But try to understand me, I'm a lonely, temperamental woman with weaknesses. After all, you're not innocent, are you? What are you trying to say? That you don't know who got you pregnant. Did Matteo tell you that? Complaining about his frivolous wife? That means you're still in touch with him. Josefina guessed. Well, not like before. Not in the way you think. Carmelita told her quickly. I don't care anymore. Then we can be friends again, as before. Lita was pleased. Everything seems so simple to you. It's like nothing ever happened. Josefina smirked. Well, why complicate things? Lita shrugged. You know, when you've been betrayed, it's like having your arms broken. You can forgive, but you can't hug anyone. Josefina sighed. You're always dramatizing things. Keep it simple. You know, Lita, don't come to me anymore. We can't be friends. Josefina said and turned her back against the wall. Well, as you wish, I won't be intrusive. Lita got up and headed for the door. Thus she paused for a moment, as if she wanted to say something else, but changed her mind and left. When Josefina was finally discharged from the hospital and returned home, she found that all of Mateo's belongings had disappeared from the apartment. There was a note waiting for her on the kitchen table. I think after everything that has happened, it would be better for us to live separately. At least until you have the baby. Right after the baby is born, we'll do a DNA test, and if the paternity is confirmed, I'll raise and take care of the baby. But if it turns out the baby is not mine, you and I will have to divorce. Josefina crumpled up the note and with a well-aimed movement of her hand sent it into the garbage can, the same place she mentally sent her husband. She didn't care where he was or who he was with. She didn't care even if he was with Lita. As soon as Josefina crossed the threshold, an excited receptionist, who was the number one gossip girl in their company, rushed to her. Oh, Josie, you have no idea what happened last week while you were away. You won't believe it. She clucked. No one expected it. Everyone is shocked. So what happened? Rena got married. She said. What happened, after all? Rena got married blurted out the secretary. Rena? Josefina asked, bewildered. Yes, can you imagine? Our local Casanova is now a married man. I couldn't believe it. They say his wife is very beautiful. They say his wife is very beautiful. And apparently, she is very clever and pushy since she was able to tame our stallion. Well, family is wonderful. 
Josefina said with a smile. Was she upset when she found out about Renaud's wedding? Not at all. It actually made her feel better. Because if she was carrying his baby under her heart, she wouldn't tell him about it now. After all, it might ruin the young family. She was so tired of all this geometry of love that the last thing she wanted was to get into another love triangle again. The remaining months of Josefina's pregnancy went easily and without complications. She went to work and chatted casually with Rana. They had friendly conversations at lunchtime, discussing his family life and her pregnancy. He was absolutely sure that she and her husband are doing well, and her big belly is clear proof of the harmony in their life. Rana never once thought that it might be his baby. Josefina went into labor on schedule. On an early autumn morning, she delivered her son. She didn't feel it necessary to tell about it to Mateo. When the nurses brought the infant for feeding, Josefina looked at her son's face, trying to guess who he looked like. The boy was an exact copy of his mother, with the same lips, the same eyes, and the curve of his eyebrows. So, you will be happy, my little one. She said softly and kissed the top of her son's head. Three days later, Josefina was discharged. She walked up to the cab waiting at the gate of the maternity hospital, holding the baby in her arms. The driver got out of the car and opened the door. How are you doing? He said cheerfully. Do you remember me? I recognized you at once. I gave you a ride last winter and you were very upset then. Josefina turned her eyes away from her son and looked intently at the cab driver. It was him, the same driver who had told her the story of his wife's infidelity. Gosh, it seems to me it was a hundred years ago, Josefina thought, as if it happened in a different life, with someone else. Of course, I remember you, and I am very glad to see you again safe and sound. She answered, getting in the car. I see that you are a mother now. That's wonderful, congratulations. The cab driver said as he started the car. Thank you. Josefina answered. I still can't believe it. Where is the father? The father? There is no father. But it will be difficult for you to cope with everything by yourself. The cab driver said after a short pause. I am not alone. There are two of us now. I remember you said it was enough to be happy. Josefina answered, smiling tenderly at her newborn son. Yes, that's right. Children are the flowers of life and they make us happy. But I believe that things will work out for you in your personal life too. I believe that too. Josefina thankfully nodded to the driver and he smiled back at her and took her and her son to their new life. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.